So thank you for uh, having me here. Um, so I have been given the task to talk about uterine leiomyosarcoma. So um, let me uh, just briefly go through the overview of this presentation. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about first-line therapies with the uh, probably the controversies associated with it. Um, I'll specifically talk about some evidence uh, behind gemcitabine and docetaxel, and I'll talk about some evidence behind doxorubicin as a single agent or the doublet of doxorubicin and iphosphamide. Then I'll follow this up with uh, talking about um, systemic therapy principles, aims, and some pathology um, with molecular studies. Then I'll briefly talk about some subsequent lines that are active in uterine leiomyosarcoma. So there's always been uh, some controversy with regards to what is the best first-line therapy in uterine leiomyosarcoma. Um, so let me go through some of the evidence backing up gemcitabine and docetaxel, and we'll go uh, through some of these uh, evidence studies chronologically. So one of the older studies uh, by the gynecology oncology group, the GOG 87L, have actually taken uh, 42 women in a phase two uh, single arm uh, study and uh, basically exposed them to gemcitabine and docetaxel until uh, disease progression. Now, this was a first line uh, study. Objective response rate was quite decent at 36% median progression-free survival of 4.4 months, and the overall survival was uh, 16 months. Toxicity as expected with uh, chemo doublets, myelosuppression, um, grade three and four neutropenia occurring in up to 20% of patients. Other side effects were fatigue, uh, GI complaints, and pulmonary toxicity. Um, one of the uh, other GOG uh, studies uh, basically have done exactly the same. However, they uh, gave gemcitabine and docetaxel in a phase two study as second line therapy um, as opposed to first line therapy in the prior trial. They had 51 patients. Now, um, we need to pay attention that 90% of those patients have actually or were exposed to uh, the traditional anthracycline, doxorubicin, as first line therapy and then they were followed up with gemcitabine and docetaxel. Um, objective response rates were uh, reported as 27%, so they were quite decent, and more than half of the patients were uh, or did not progress at six months. Now, this is quite uh, an essential study that, um, as a medical oncologist, I always uh, quote uh, to my patients. Now, the GEDIS trial was um, a trial that was published in Lancet in 2017. It basically compared head-to-head -head doxorubicin against gemcitabine and docetaxel in a large cohort of metastatic uh, soft tissue sarcoma. Now, with regards to number, they've taken a little bit more than 200 patients, so 130 in each arm, with the primary endpoint being progression-free survival at 24 weeks after randomization. So... Um, now, why is this important for me to report here when I'm talking about leiomyosarcoma? It's basically because one third of the metastatic soft tissue sarcoma patients here were actually uterine leiomyosarcoma patients. Now, in this trial, in the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve on the right-hand side, you can see that the progression-free survival was quite similar. In fact, they're almost touching each other. Um, so median PFS was... Um, not statistically different. It was 5.4 for doxorubicin and 5.5 for gemcitabine. Overall survival was slightly favoring doxorubicin. However, this was not statistically significant uh, with a hazard ratio of 1.07 uh, with 16.4 months with doxorubicin and 14.5 months with uh, doxorubicin and gemcitabine. Now, when we look at the um, primary endpoint, because the study was powered for the primary endpoint, um, which was the PFS at 24 uh, weeks after randomization, um, you can see that they're also similar. 46% for doxorubicin single agent, uh, sorry, 46.1% and 46.0% for, dox for um, uh, gemcitabine and docetaxel. So basically what we can conclude from this study is that first line setting for metastatic soft tissue sarcoma, they're almost identical. Now, um, 
with regards to some evidence behind whether doxorubicin versus doxorubicin doublet would be of benefit in such cohort of patients, we always quote the large EORTC study, um, which was published in Lancet in 2014 by Judson and his colleagues. So this basically compared doxorubicin against doxorubicin and iphosphamide, uh, so doublets versus single agents. Response rates were double for the chemo doublet. Progression-free survival was also double, which was statistically significant. However, overall survival was not statistically significant. So it was 12.8 months for doxorubicin as single agent and 14.3 months for doxorubicin and ephosphamide. Um, and of course, expectedly, patients with the chemo doublets were expected to have more toxicity, more side effects, and more dose, inter uh, dose reductions, as well as dose uh, interruptions. So one of the, uh, or two of the prior studies backing up gemcitabine and docetaxel were two phase two trials that looked at patients with leiomyosarcoma of uterine versus GI origin. And they have shown um, decent objective response rates. However, this was uh, a small phase two trial. Another phase two trial also looked at patients with metastatic soft tissue sarcoma um, and tested gem against docetaxel and gemcitabine. And the objective response rate expectedly with the uh, doublet was higher, was in fact double at 16%, with progression-free survival 6.2, uh, which was double than the three months with gemcitabine as single agent. Um, another older phase two uh, trial uh, looked at gem versus uh, gem dosi in patients with uterine against non-uterine leiomyosarcoma. Sample size was 90. Um, and basically, they found that patients with uterine leiomyosarcoma, the objective response rates was slightly higher uh, as opposed to patients with non-uterine leiomyosarcoma, with 24% against 19%. Um, of course, um, these patients were given GEM against GEM and docetaxel. So it was four-arm study. Uh, and GEM cytobine as a single agent was found to be less toxic and less efficacious. Now, just talking about some broad concepts, um, we always think about the, uh, the um, downfalls of tissue biopsy, specifically in patients who do not get um, hysterectomies and salpingeophrectomies. Now, one of the limitations of uh, tissue biopsy is it takes a small sample of tissue. Does it actually reflect the whole disease? Um, perhaps it does, perhaps it doesn't. We always think, should think about the biological behavior of, of tumors, whether they're aggressive and whether they're indolent. Um, patient with indolent, uh, indolent behaving uh, leiomyosarcomas, um, we can entertain surveillance, specifically in patients with low volume disease and patients who do not have significant symptoms. Now, also as a general principle, if a patient has oligometastatic disease, we should always think about radical and think about local therapy, uh, be it surgery versus um, uh, stereotactic radiation or other types of local therapy. And systemic therapy should always um, be thought about um, uh, sort of as a last resort with maintenance of quality of life as one of the primary objectives. Now, <clears throat> just talking briefly about two subtypes of uterine leiomyosarcomas. There's the epithelioid subtype and the myxoid uh, subtype of uterine leiomyosarcomas. So epithelioid subtype, slightly more aggressive with a higher mitotic index of more than four per 10 high power fields. PGR fusions can be found by fish. Immunohistochemical uh, staining uh, would show positivity for Desmond and SMA. Um, and the non-presence of HMB45 uh, and Milan A is also confirmatory. Now, it can overlap with PE comas, which we treat as um, uh, medical uh, oncologists uh, specializing in sarcomas. And these patients typically benefit or do not benefit from chemotherapy um, and benefit from uh, single uh, agent mTOR inhibitors. Now, with myxoid uh, uterine leiomyosarcoma, perhaps a bit more indolent or a bit less aggressive compared to the epithelioid with uh, lower mitotic indices of more than uh, one or more than uh, an equal to one per 10 high power fields. PLAG1 fusion is found uh, positive by fish in one quarter of patients. Immunohistochemically, um, 
these patients are, can be hormonally uh, positive. So ER and, and progesterone receptors can be positive and hence um, they can be exposed to hormonal uh, therapies. Desmond and P-like expression are confirmatory uh, with regards to um, uh, diagnosing. Now, as a broad category, um, I think molecular studies have advanced significantly in the medical oncology field. Um, now, this is quite general and broad. However, we need to talk about it. So microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden, um, both of these, if positive, so specifically TMB of more than 10 and MSI unstable or um, MMR deficient, these patients, if positive, would um, uh, would definitely benefit from pembrolizumab, and there's an, an FDA approval for uh, all tumor subtypes. Um, N-TRAC fusions have actually gained more uh, uh, attention and, and have had more studies uh, recently. And if patients um, are or have N-TRAC fusion uh, positivity, they may be exposed to larotrectinib or entractinib with significant or impressive objective response rates. Um, now, a bit of historical background, we always, or we previously used to quote to our patients that overall survival in general for metastatic soft tissue sarcoma with uterine leiomyosarcoma in general being part of it is around a year. Um, previously, uh, chemotherapeutic agents were old, more toxic, and were a bit more limited. More recently, we have had more uh, uh, systemic chemotherapeutic and probably more targeted agents, which have resulted in better survival. Probably we have incorporated better and earlier palliative care in such patients. Um, pathologists have had better advancements in confirmation of diagnoses. We should never forget the importance of multidisciplinary team meetings. And nowadays we quote um, overall survival in such patients at around 16 to 19 months. Now, the aim of systemic therapy has always been to downstage advanced disease. Now, we always think about the chemotherapy doublets, and I have mentioned to you previously that when we combine doxorubicin and ifosfamide, that the objective response rate is going to be more superior as opposed to single agent chemotherapeutic agents. Um, so if we want to downstage, specifically in patients with better ECOG performance status, we should always use doublets. Now, when we think about palliation and patients who are weaker, worse uh, ECOG performance status, we should always think about single agent and sequential therapies with maintenance of quality of life being um, the main priority. Now, with regards to second line therapy and beyond, I have mentioned in the prior slides uh, a few studies talking about gemcitabine and docetaxel in the second line therapy. So um, it is a valid option if it was not given as a first line as well as doxorubicin with or without ifosfamide if the patient was not exposed to it as first line. Now, interestingly, there was a study that looked at GEM alone, infused over 90 minutes as opposed to infused over 30 minutes. And in sarcoma patients, it has been shown that if you infuse it over 90 minutes, that the um, uh, uh, tumor uh, effect would actually be higher. Now, I'm going to spend a bit of time on third-line uh, therapies. Most of these um, are actually single agents. So pegylated liposomal doxorubicin is active in uh, soft tissue sarcomas. It has been compared to, uh, to doxorubicin as a single agent in a phase two uh, study. And uh, basically, to keep it short, um, it was very similar. Response rates were quite low um, at 10 and 9%. However, this was an old study by Ian Judson and his colleagues in 2001, and a significant number of those patients were actually just patients. So these patients do not respond to chemotherapy. Now, trabectidin um, is an interesting molecule. It's basically synthetically derived from a Caribbean sea sponge, and it basically induces P53 independent cell apoptosis. It is FDA approved, uh, in patients with L sarcomas, so liposarcomas and leiomyosarcomas, following or after exposure to prior anthracycline. Now, um, 
one of the prior phase two study of trabectidin showed a response rate of up to 70%, very modest PFS of almost two months, and overall survival reaching 12 months in patients with L sarcomas. So this expanded this trial into a phase three study that compared it to one of the older sarcoma uh, um, chemotherapeutic agents called the carbazine. So two to one randomization, trabected into the carbazine in lipo and lyomyosarcoma patients. Very large number of patients at uh, 518. Um, so um, basically this has shown that the overall survival is a bit more than one year, so 12.9 months. Um, and progression-free survival was superior at 4.2 months. And clinical benefit rate, so clinical benefit rate combines uh, stable disease, partial response, and complete responders was double that of the carbazine at 35%, which was statistically significant. So based on this, the FDA approval happened. Now, eribulin is also an interesting uh, molecule. It's a non-taxane microtubule inhibitor. It is FDA approved in metastatic breast cancer who have been exposed to two or more chemotherapeutic agents and FDA approved in liposarcoma specifically, not lyomyosarcoma. However, I'm gonna talk about the study very briefly. So an older phase two study um, published in 2011, um, uh, basically looked at eribulin in multiple soft tissue sar sarcoma subtypes, and basically looked at uh, specifically L sarcomas, so lipo and lyomyosarcomas, and found that these patients were the patients that benefited the most. So a phase three trial looked at lipo and lyomyosarcoma patients, um, compared one-to-one -one comparison between eribulin and the carbazine, and basically found that patients with lipo uh, sarcoma had the highest overall survival benefit um, compared to patients with lyomyosarcoma. Based on that, the FDA approval happened for liposarcoma only and not lyomyosarcoma. However, the NCCN panel um, or expert group still um, does report that eribulin may be uh, of value in lyomyosarcoma patients who have been exposed to multiple agents before. Bazopinib, um, multi-target TKI, basically anti-VEGF and anti-PDGFR alpha. It's FDA approved in soft tissue sarcoma patients who have been exposed to prior chemotherapy. Palette trial was a large phase three trial that basically um, uh, looked at uh, pezopinib as opposed to placebo, and basically have shown um, that uh, pezopinib uh, does improve uh, um, your uh, progression-free survival significantly. Now, Dr. Let's... Farad, uh, yes. two more minutes. Two sure. more minutes. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, just of note, the uh, bezopinib dose was, was quite high at 800 uh, milligrams uh, daily, and not a lot of patients tolerate this. Um, I will skip that. Now, this is a new molecule that I think is quite promising. A study on enlotinib was published in JCO in 2018. Um, now, this was a, a phase three study that looked at specific subtypes, so synovial uh, sarcoma, lyomyosarcoma, and ASPS. Now, the comparator arm was placebo, and basically progression-free survival was superior with anlotinib. However, this still has not resulted in FDA approval, and I think more studies are being done comparing it with the carbazine um, with the aim of showing superiority and hopeful, hopefully leading to um, uh, an, an FDA approval. Now, last uh, two slides. Immunotherapy has not been very promising in uh, lyomyosarcoma, specifically uterine lyomyosarcoma cohorts. Um, one of the largest uh, trials, the SARC-028, uh, which was published by Toulmont um, and colleagues in uh, 2018, has basically taken um, four cohorts. So UPS, undifferentiated pleomorphic, uh, pleomorphic sarcoma. Last cohort was lyomyosarcoma. No responses, unfortunately, were seen in the lyomyosarcoma patients. Now, um, when we dig deep into the trial, it's very important to mention that patients with lyomyosarcoma had 0% PDL expression. Other patients with responses had more PDL1 expression. Now, um, overall survival um, was actually not um, uh, bad. And the, in, in all comers in the soft tissue sarcoma group was reaching 49 weeks, so almost one year. However, 
this actually tells us the importance of stable disease as opposed to significant reduction in such uh, patients. Now, this, uh, this is my last slide. So this basically looks at other immunotherapy trials with uh, soft tissue sarcoma, specifically leiomyosarcoma. Unfortunately, a significant number of them have been negative. Um, now, when you look at the median overall survival uh, here, it's, uh, or most of them are actually reaching uh, or close to one year or more than nine months, which is um, significant in patients who have he uh, been heavily pretreated. However, when we look at response rates, um, a significant number of them uh, are actually quite low and a significant number of them is actually zero. And again, this tells us about the importance of stable disease as opposed to partial response in such population. And by that, I conclude. Thank you all for listening.